Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr Ron Ehrlich. Now, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, today we are going to be exploring the world of psychedelics. We are going to be exploring mental health. We are going to be looking at all sorts of issues around that. And it's a far-reaching conversation. It's one that I've been looking forward to for many weeks uh, since I was first introduced to our guest. And my guest today is Nigel Denning. He is a counselling psychologist in private practice, working with individuals, couples and family. Now, Nigel sees therapy as a joint and cooperative enterprise, which is a great foundation for any health practitioner seeing to have their clients or patients achieve their full potential. And Nigel is definitely into people achieving their full potential. He redefines integrative, putting it into a psychotherapeutic perspective. He studied in Australia and overseas with many current leaders in psychological research and theories, including Dan Siegel, John Gottman, Alan Shaw, Uh, the late Michael White, and as well as the legendary Stanislav Grok. Now, we cover, apart from the the term integrative psychology and what that means, we talk about trauma, depression, psychedelic therapies, and we touch on the pandemic and a whole range of other things. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Nigel. Welcome to the show, Nigel. Kira, Ron. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Nigel, integrative is a term that I feel very uh, connected with because I've been in healthcare, medicine, dentistry for a long time. But uh, integrative takes a different meaning in in your context. Can you can you share with us that that context of integrative sure. psychology? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, an integrative approach to psychotherapy is is a way of trying to look at all of the different psychotherapies, all 600 odd different discrete models of psychotherapy and starting to think more about how we can apply the skills, the knowledge and the, 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 the information that we've got to best serve the individual needs of the individual patient. Um, so it, 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 it's a way of trying to bring together wisdoms, knowledge, research, so that rather than having a, a kind of a, a, a position where I'm a cognitive behavioural therapist and you're a psychodynamic therapist and we do different things, it's about understanding what those differences are, how they can be best brought to serve patients generally, how they can help with our case conceptualisation and treatment planning using this, this incredible bol- you know, richness of different method and different different approach. So an integrative approach is, a, is it's not eclecticism. It's about systematically engaging different modalities for different times for different conditions and, and, and developing a more skillful way of, of drawing together these differences in, in the service of our, our, our treatments to, to get better outcomes. For our patients um, and longer, longer lasting outcomes. I mean, you've been a psychologist for many years uh, and, and your journey, I'm, I mean, it must have been a journey of picking these things up as you go into your toolkit. Or Can you tell us a little bit about how, how you came to take this more integrative approach? Yeah, I, I guess my, my early influences were from the kind of humanistic branches. So Carl Rogers, um, then um, Michael White had a, had a strong influence on me, the, the narrative therapist from Adelaide, from Dulwich in Adelaide, um, who really did a lot of work. And both of those are, are, are talking about the, the opportunities, about the strengths and really trying to help people find parts of themselves I then then kind of went down the path of of, of the more um, treatment specific therapies like CBT or ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy or dialectic behaviour therapy. And I've I've kind of trained in each of those modalities as well. So what what you end up with is is a kind of an ability to kind of see the experience of of the other, understand it's the, the presenting problem and then work different techniques for different kind of parts of the problem. So it, it, it's it's really just a, a, a culmination of many, many years of, of study. And, and I, I, I've, I've done a lot of work in seeking out leaders in the field and, and, and going to study with them. So, um, you know, uh, 
w when I see a modality, I try to work with the pro the principal um, uh, developer of that modality and just get get a really close understanding of what that looks like. So in more recent years, I've, I've done quite a bit of work with Dan Siegel, who's uh, mm, yes. um, developed um, something called interpersonal neurobiology. So trying to, to kind of create some linkage between the, the brain and the underlying biology and these psychological theories. So that we're, we're starting to kind of understand the more nuanced relationship between mind and brain. It's so interesting because from a health perspective, what we've been um, looking at is the connection between gut and brain. Hmm. And uh, yeah. interpersonal neurobiology sounds like we're starting to get down to the biochemistry of various mental hmm. states. Which is so yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because in, in for example, depression or, or in psych psychiatrists tend to reach for the prescription pad. Uh, maybe that's, yeah. uh, is, that, is that a fair assessment? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> because, because the way that psych psychiatry has been so medicalised, mm. it's, it's no longer compulsory in, in training to do a lot of psychotherapeutic training. So it, it, it's biopharmacology is the primary modality, and the therapy is the sort of the, the, the add-on. And so, and but the but the most disturbing, I think, as a consumer, I'm not you know of this kind of thing, it would be okay if it's a brain imbalance. What tests are done to establish that imbalance and how we titrate our treatment? And and it's yeah. kind of alarming to know that's actually not the case. What is what, where does interpersonal neurobiology? fit into that? How, how is that approached? Well, it, it, it's, using, it's using an understanding of developmental biology um, and, and the way that, that, that you know, we, what we begin as heterozygotes, we, 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 we start differentiating once, you know, two half cells fuse and then we, 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 all, of, all of our thinking, all of our being is, is, is premised on a biological underpinning. But that, that, that whole developmental process from birth onwards is, is all held in a relational field. So, you know, a child doesn't learn, doesn't, doesn't learn biological regulation without an adult. Brockers and Wernicke's areas in the brain, the language centres of the brain, don't engage fully if the child isn't in relationship. Mm. Down regulation of hyperarousal doesn't occur. So full uh, modulation of the limbic brain doesn't occur without relationship. Mm. So, so what we're talking about is, is the way that we emerge from our biology through relationship into this other kind of thing that we don't quite understand called mind or consciousness, which, which somehow has a, a very close relationship with biology but isn't defined by it. So as, as an experienced meditator, for instance, you know, what, what, what we see is, you know, we, we can, through an act of will, choose to do something such as meditation, which then feeds back into our brain and changes the underlying biological structure of the brain. Mm. So the, 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 the relationship between mind and brain is still one that philosophers are grappling with. And certainly we don't have a scientific a detailed and, and, and agreed scientific understanding of. So there, there's, there's something very clearly going on in a, in a kind of feedback system. Mm. And so interpersonal neurobiology is really kind of speaking to the underlying biology, but trying to relate it to, to the psychological as well. It's so interesting because I remember uh, seeing the work of um, a new neuroscientist, David, he's in Canada. Uh, anyway, he did a program called The Brain, and uh, he showed that uh, children who were in Romanian orphanages for the first two years mm -hmm. of their lives, which hadn't, uh, hadn't even um, had any physical contact, let alone facial uh, feedback, uh, were, yeah. were, scarred almost, were scarred for life. In those yep. first two years, and I know, and I know the Jesuits have often said, "Show me the person at, at seven. I think they said, yeah. "Show me the boy, and yeah. I'll show you the man." But I, I actually worked with um, some some people who had adopted Romanian children. Wow! Um, and when they'd gone through adolescence, um, extraordinary um, psychological illnesses, wounds that, that were being expressed because they didn't they didn't get the the, the whole the whole idea of the Romanian babies. Ceausescu set up these um, orphanages and thought in, in very material terms. So the babies were fed and changed, but they were given no emotional engagement. And so what 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 we know, now know is that the, the limbic brain where where affect is regulated, where all our social animal functioning comes from, it's not a human kind of functioning, but that that is is switched on through relationship. 
And there are, there are seven or eight discrete circuits that, that create different affects which help us socialise. And we need a human being, we need an adult human to engage them. Yes, and imprinted very early on in, in, a, in stage. And I thought it was also very interesting in this time of Botox that uh, the inability of the child to facially mirror, mirror yeah. what is going yeah. on in the adult that they're looking at has is quite yeah. quite concerning. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed Tronic, um, is an American researcher, does a lot of work. There's some some great YouTube footage of that that reflective facial expression between a mother and a child. That's that's his area of yeah. research. So how how the maternal expression imprints on the infant expression it's, it's quite fascinating watching. Yes. Um, he, he calls it the still face paradigm. Yes, of, of which sadly there are too many around at the moment, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, we we kind of met through the uh, the Mind Medicine Australia group and, uh, you know, I was we, I think we were both at that psychedelic summit that was held, psychedelic therapy summit that was held in online but in Melbourne um, last year. You've had some experience with that. Your, one of your mentors we talked about before you, we came on was Stanislaw Grof. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered if we might talk a little bit about that history too because it has such great potential, yet politics or, or seem to have got in the way. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so Stan, Stan was a psychiatrist in um, working in Prague, um, the former Czech Republic, and um, their, their hospital received a, um, a, a shipment of of medication from um, the Sandoz Laboratory from Albert Hoffman, who, who invented LSD or discovered LSD accidentally. And Hoffman um, forwarded this, this, this package to, to Groff's work and, and they, they then um, tested, trialled the medication and then started using it clinically. Um, and as a result of that work, um, Stan was invited to Harvard University to teach and was then invited to participate in the setting up of a psychiatric and forensic hospital um, as part of a research team um, in Maryland. And so they, they were doing quite um, um, trailblazing work in the treatment of severe mental illness using psychedelics. And there was a huge movement. There were, there were thousands of papers produced. There was, there was huge amounts of research going on through the um, 50s, late 50s, through the 60s. Um, and um, yeah, Richard Nixon um, was well. It, it was a it was a famous case where they 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 were concerned about the impact of psychedelics on the general population. And um, well, I can't remember the, the exact quote, but um, uh, uh, there'd never been a medicine discovered that changed the way people voted before. And so there's this sort of whole sort of social movement going on as well. And, and a lot of the work, you know, there we, we've got these famous cases of people like Tim Leary, who was you know, largely irresponsible in the way that he was using um, the, the, the medicine. So, so essentially what, what, what was a good, strong clinical process got out into the community, had an impact that, that, that wasn't really understood, and the response was to shut everything down. Mm. criminalise it completely, so not to, to kind of educate, not to you know, go through any kind of harm reduction processes and bring it back into the medical realm um, where it should sit, um, but instead they, they just shut the whole, the, whole, um, the whole project down. So it's 1971, and so the last, the last clinical dose, I think, was administered by Bill Richards in about 1976, and that was the very last research project until the last decade or so when we, we, we've seen a re-emergence. But, um, yeah, Stan, Stan was, was a, a, a real kind of trailblazer in that, that area. And he, as a frustration with the medical system that he was operating from in those days, remembering we're talking the 60s and 70s, um, he, he, along with people like um, Anthony Sutich and Abraham Maslow, who you might be familiar with mm -hmm. from Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, yes. They developed another model of psychology that they called um, uh, uh, transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. And Stan was was uh, ran international conferences, brought together a whole lot of thinkers um, from shamanic traditions, from Eastern traditions, from um, other sort of experimental traditions, trying to explore um, the, the the role of psychology beyond um, beyond illness, beyond the personal. 
and into kind of more of human potential. And that, that, that kind of led to the human potential movement. So Stan was a very, very, and still is, he's, he's in his 90s now, but uh, it's just, just a real trailblazer. And I, I was lucky enough to, I, 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 my first mentor was a, a close collaborator of his. I met um, back in the 1980s, God, that dates me, doesn't it? Uh, oh, well, you and know, then, maturing, then you're 10 maturing. years later, I met Stan. So I had had the pleasure of working with Stan over over the last 30 years. And uh, his his chief of staff, Tab Sparks, we um, we actually ran a, um, a centre together in um, North Cal in uh, northern um, uh, in the United States and the East Coast, uh, North Carolina. And, and people's sort of stereotypical view of LSD is that pop culture, like let's just, uh, what do they call it, uh, um, drop in and drop in and drop out or something like that, drop yeah. one and drop out or something. But, but it's far more, I mean, can you describe what that, how that looks like within a clinical context and, and what are some yeah. of the benefits of what, I, mean, I know a lot of people have described it as one of the top five experiences in their lives. Which, yeah. which would very rarely, no one would ever describe a treatment of any illness, be that mental or physical, yeah. as the top five experiences of their lives. Tell us yeah, a little that, bit that, about that in a clinical setting. Yeah, the, the top five experiences came from the, the, um, uh, the Good Friday experiments and uh, Walter Pankey, um, who um, administered a dose of psilocybin, and, and um, Rick Doblin, the head of the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies in the United States um, rec uh, tracked down the the, um, the people that participated in that study thirty years later, mm. and they were still still saying that you know about eighty percent of them that um, that that psychedelic experience was one of the most important, one of the five most important experiences in their life. What 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 we get with psychedelics, and and this is um, there's some interesting work by um, a researcher from Britain called Robin Carhart Harris, who's recently moved to the United States. He talks about something called the default mode network, and this is why this is where you know this kind of interesting intersect between biology and psychology starts to to to, to occur. And what 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 he's hypothesising is that. And, and there's there's some neurological studies that support this idea. When when someone's locked in a say a state of non-responsive depression, they've been suffering their whole lives, and nothing seems to work. What 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 the idea is is that somehow their brain has adapted to the environment in such a rigid way that there, there's no possibility of shift or change. And so they're, they're kind of trapped in a pattern of neural linkage um, that, that's been developed and, and established over, usually over many years, but, but can you know, happen more spontaneously. And so when we, when we introduce a psychedelic in a therapeutic container, so what, what I mean by that is that the person that, that's being given the psychedelic has met a therapist, they built a relationship with that therapist, that therapist understands the history of that, that, that patient from, from birth to now, you know, understands any traumas that have occurred, any, any you know, difficulties, any problems in their environment. And so they have, they, and, and they've established trust. The, the therapist has also explained a lot of both the positives and negatives that can occur through a psychedelic experience. So the person's well, well established, well primed to, to then take the medicine just before then in, in the, the talk session before the medicine the second therapist is introduced because we never do this one-on-one -on -one. and that's because the length of a psychedelic session can be quite quite long I mean depending on the medicine they can run up to eight hours mm. and just sitting with someone as a therapist wow. for eight hours wow. is exhausting yes. So having a having a, a, a colleague in there is, is useful, but it's also for and we try and work with male female dyads because when someone goes into a psychedelic state, we can't predict what will emerge from that, and so having a male and female present just allows for for any kind of support that may be necessary um, if, if issues come up if you know there, there's a trauma related to one gender, then you've got someone else there to kind of help mitigate it. But what happens in the psychedelic session is new opportunities for brain linkage emerge. Hmm. 
we call we, we're drawing on on people will be familiar probably now after um, uh, the popularization of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. and we go through a process called neurogenesis for up to five days after the delivery of a psychedelic medicine and what this is it, it, it's it's the, the establishment of new pathways new potential linkages um, Hebb's law says neurons that fire together wire together. So what, what we get is this, this surge of new linkages occurring. And so the therapeutic task is to really support that and allow that subjective emergence because everyone's different. So we have to allow in that, particularly in that five window, five, five days of neurogenesis, we need to support the emergence of new patterns. And, and you'll see that this is what, when, when people say that the psychedelic experience was one of the best in their life, what they've experienced there is a completely spontaneously different way of experiencing the world. And for them, it's, it's, it's kind of lingered on. And so in therapy, what we're trying to do is when, when people have these new experiences, and they may not always be positive, they may just have a new experience of how to approach some traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. But we're creating this newness and we're trying to then support that in the therapy in order to create this, this, this new set of opportunities, new set of linkages. So the default no mode network in a trauma case stops those linkages from occurring and the therapy opens up the def like frees up the default yeah. mode network? Yeah, correct, correct. The default mode network is, is a sort of the, 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 part of the, the, the structures, the linkages in our brain that we'd be familiar with when we are kind of daydreaming. Mm. It's a sort of resting place of, of, of connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it, and it's, it, it's, it's not quite unconscious. It's not quite fully conscious. It just kind of sits there as a resting kind of place. And when people don't respond to psychotherapy, it's usually because that whole structure is rigid. So when someone's suffering from trauma, they've gone into a response to, to a situation or circumstance that they, they don't have an option of dealing with. They, they just get stuck in, in, a, in a singular or set of responses to that, that experience and they don't move out of it. Hmm. And that, that's, that's the, the, the real tragedy of something like PTSD. It's like, it's like that entrapment in the past. It's interesting because I've been interested in chronic musculoskeletal pain for most of my professional life. And the key factor there is that muscles have memory and that memory can mm -hmm. go on for a lifetime. And to hear yeah. you, and that's about an injury, a trauma, an accident. And it's interesting to hear you now on a psychological level say we have these trapped neural linkages where we just go round and round and round and we just can't seem yeah. to escape from them, it's uh, it's like a release a release mechanism of of opening up that Absolutely. default mode network. How yeah. sad yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, how sad that this has and continues to be still. I mean, I know through the Mind Medicine Australia, and I'd recommend this uh, site to anybody listening because I think it's a great organisation. I think we both agree on that. Um, yeah. But sadly, the as Australian Therapeutic Goods Association has recently. Uh, not approved its its use, and that was somewhat frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll go at that again. So what we, um, I, I now run um, Mind Medicine Institute. So we're we're a a, a structure that's that's come out of Mind Medicine Australia, um, and, I, and I run it with my partner, Dr. Trail Dowie, specifically to to hold the clinical an educational component of the work because Mind Medicine Australia is a very broad based charity that's very much interested in social change and advocacy. And so Peter and Tanya saw, saw the need for a, a more clinically governed um, and probably more conservative approach to the work as well. And so what, what we're, we're trying to, to suggest to the TGA is that we are really working hard at making sure that we are training clinicians in an understanding of the nuances of this work that we're taking this very, very responsibly and that we, we, we understand the need for very, very structured, clinical, ethically governed, scientifically governed approaches and practices in this work. As we're discovering and, and exploring a medicine that we, we don't fully understand, we don't fully understand the mechanisms, we don't fully understand impact on consciousness. Mm. So. Um, but you know that that's the exploration of science, isn't it? You know that that's that's what what's so brilliant about the scientific method. We work, we move into what we don't understand systematically because we know that there are benefits here. Yes. 
we know that there are huge benefits in all of the trials around the world, both in the previous iteration in the 50s and 60s and in the more recent um, iteration of research, all the trials are showing really positive. It's not a panacea. It's not, you know, the magic pill. It's not going to fix everyone. People, not everyone benefits. But when it, when it benefits treatment-resistant patients, it can be quite spectacular in its results. So we need to understand mm. that. We need to systematise it. Wouldn't it be nice, though, Nigel, if every medication that the TGA approved was held up to the standard that we need to know everything about its safety and efficacy and be sure that there are no side effects. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the TGA were extending that to all medications? But let's not go down that path too far. It's good to hear that you and Trail, Trail Dowie, who's also coming onto the podcast, I'm really looking forward to talking to him, uh, are doing this Mind Medicine Institute. And, you know, it sounds like a a course I might be doing in, in, in years ahead too, who knows. But um, trauma is such a huge and growing problem. Can you talk to us a little bit about trauma? What, how do you define it? You know, what, what, what effects can it have? It, it's, it's a really big issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tra- trauma, trauma, as we understand it, is, is, is really a, a, an experience that cannot be incorporated. That would okay. be the simplest way to kind of uh, explain it. So something has happened to someone that their their mind, their brain is unable to fully process. So the way the way the the complexity of the human brain and mind work is that that unprocessable experience simply gets hived off into like a like a filing system in the brain. And what then happens is people forget how to get there. And so. What, what then that, that means is that, that that thing continues to influence their present behaviours without them necessarily knowing exactly how, how it links. Mm. And so it's like, a, it's, it's like a ghost of the past echoing into the future and into the present and just um, stalking people, influencing their behaviour, influencing their reactivities based on something that is no longer active. Mm. Mm. Um, it can happen systematically through something we call, and it's not recognised in the DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychological Disorders. It is in the um, the ICD, the European Manual, complex trauma, where things happen developmentally in childhood. We either get too too much of one thing or not enough of another, mm-hmm. and that sets up all sorts of vulnerabilities for someone who goes off to a war zone yes. or is assaulted. Um, so we, we get this kind of linkage between kind of developmental vulnerability and adult experience that compounds the impact of trauma. But it's all, all, all comes back to the same thing, that experiences were unable to be integrated mm. at the time that they occurred, whether that's continuously through childhood or through a singular event like a major catastrophe or an assault. Yeah. And it's a very personal experience, isn't it? I mean... When we start comparing one to the other, it doesn't really work like that when we're talking about trauma, no, does it? No, that's right. Because, you know, we, we, we can all, we can, 10, 10 people can go through the same experience and, um, you know, two of them can be fine with it and eight of them can be impacted by it. We, we, we discovered this um, years ago, a guy called James Pennybaker uh, from the University of Austin um, was exploring um, critical incident debriefing where, that there was a, a wisdom at one point where, you know, wherever there was like a train wreck or something, you know, a whole phalanx of counsellors would descend on the disaster and start talking to people about processing. Mm. And what, what they discovered is that for, for, for a number of people that were being processed in that way, rather than helping them to integrate the experience, what they were doing was rigidifying <laughs> and creating a traumatic response. So what, what we've, we've learned since then is that we provide immediate, you know, kind of respite for people that have gone through disaster, but create and, and normalise the opportunity to talk to someone in the days and weeks following, but we don't impose that on them. We make that an opportunity and that way the person makes that subjective choice depending on their level of distress and that way we can help work through the, 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 the subjective differences to, to the same experience. Yes, the, um, that, that whole trauma story we were doing, uh, who was also a guest at the Psychedelic Therapies, uh, Admiral Chris Barry, 
who was the chief of the Defence Force up until 2002, and uh, he was talking about trauma, PTSD specifically, and, of course, the stereotypical one is you've come back from a battle zone and, uh, and, and it's sobering. It was actually sobering to learn that 50 people have died on the battlefield but 500 have committed suicide. So that's an indication of the size of the problem. But he made the point that this affects every Australian in one, to one degree or another because how you define trauma doesn't have to be a battlefield instance. It, it's, we're hearing a lot about childhood abuse, domestic violence... Yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, and this is affecting either you've suffered it or lived with someone who is suffering from it. Um, depression yeah. is another huge and growing problem and how one defines it. I mean, I used to think um, I was uh, shy, but now I also realise I could have social anxiety disorder. That's not quite depression. But how we define mental health is an important one. Tell us a little bit about depression and, and what how how we should be viewing that. Mm, mm. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Like for, from from my perspective, and and, and because I, I take a developmental approach to to understanding people's subjective experience, and there, there's a reasonable amount of research that supports this as well. Depression is rarely a spontaneous response that comes from nothing. Depression is usually a response to unregulated stress over an extended period of time. Not always, there's always variability in, in, in any of this, but by and large, when, when I've worked with people that are, that, are, that are depressed, they'll come with a, with a history of certain things not working the way they wanted them or needed them to work and a response, a stress response to that and chronic anxiety. So social anxiety would be a classic precursor to depression because someone keeps going into the environment, it doesn't get better, um, they get they, the, 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 the pain they experience going out into a public space. They keep doing it because they think it'll get better next time and they'll, they'll have a whole set of you know, thoughts and ideas and responses and emotions set up around it. And then sometimes in some people, they just become exhausted and, and, and they collapse into a depressed state. So. You know, and this is you know one of the, the the brain secretes a whole whole series of neurotransmitters to to flatten arousal, so to 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 switch things off, and so people just swing into this kind of flattened state where they will describe helplessness and hopelessness and, and those sort of emotional states. But the, it, it it's really comes from some some form of powerlessness, mm. being being subject to pain, suffering, distress. Here, yes, over a chronic period of time with no relief. Yeah, we were talking before we came on about stress and obviously it's a major focus of this podcast. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I and I've written, written a book called The Life Less Stress. So, you know, I've always sort of thought of stress as either fight or flight and rest and digest. But the work of Stephen Porges and uh, polyvagal theory goes adds a, adds a third dimension to that, doesn't it? Because when people are, uh, are faced with a traumatic event, often it's said, well, why didn't you run? Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you just, why did you just lie there? And there's actually a neurological explanation for that. Can we talk a little bit about that polyvagal theory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, there's, there's some anatomical issues around the polyvagal theory. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a not an anatomist, so um, I won't go there. Yeah. But I mean, uh, Bruce Perry also talks about this. Um, we've got um, Alan Shaw talks a lot about this as well. So there, there, there's there's different sources for for this, and, and um, Dan Siegel in his interpersonal neurobiology talks a lot about it as well. So biologically, we begin as a hyper aroused little animal. You know, like at birth, human beings can't do much. They wriggle toward, wriggle away, and that's about it. You know, in the first days, we have to learn our reflexes. We have to learn how to organise vision in the first weeks and, and months of life. We learn how to hear, and then we learn how to how to regulate ourselves. The, the thing that's... that's and, if, and if you look at, you know, say a, a, a baby zebra, a foal being born, they're up and moving within a few hours, and the herd is supporting them, and they're, they're off. Now, human beings are dependent for years, and we start with an amygdala, 
So that's the, the, the part of our brain, a little walnut-shaped thing on each side of our head around, around our ears. The amygdala is, is, is the main organ that, that, that regulates fear response and, and survival response. So flight, fight, freeze. And we've got a, a hippocampus partially formed at birth. And so at the birth, we're just, we're just an upregulated little animal wanting to survive, totally dependent on the neurological structures of the adult to either downregulate us or leave us in a constantly upregulated state if that adult doesn't have the skill, ability, availability to provide that neurological downregulation. So we stay in this upregulated state and we, 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 we're vulnerable, we, we adapt to it, we find ways to kind of operate in this hyper, hypo aroused sort of state and that and that's that's how we kind of that, that, that's that's the cause of biological base of a lot of suffering for people mm. is the fact that they haven't learned they haven't been shown because they haven't had the right relational field and this is where therapy comes in this is the corrective experience in therapy we teach people how to downregulate. Mm. we teach people how to engage processes in their brain and in their mind to help down regulate that wild animal hyper arousal that we're all subject to now, the other, the, the, the problem in trauma and in psychological suffering is when the upregulation, the hyperarousal response of flight fight isn't working, we can't fight our way out of it, we can't run away from it, we can't go there. The secondary and the more powerful kind of response is downregulation, hypoarousal. Now, a, a little rabbit will, will do that regularly when it's out grazing and, you know, it, it, it's, it intuits the hawk above. It'll go into a state of freeze and it will, it, it, it's, it's muscles. It's, it's, it's something called striatic anxiety, this tensing of muscles that, that, and, and, and a change of heart rate, change of breathing. And the animal is just, just frozen. And that gives it an opportunity to, for, for the predators not to see it and an opportunity to survive. There's a secondary down regulatory mechanism, however, when the, 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 the animal is attacked and it can't, again, can't get away, it's, it's, it's about to die, organs start to shut down. And it creates a death-like state. And this is um, um, what, what Dan Siegel calls um, the dorsal dive, the dorsal vagal system shuts down organs. Um, and that, that gives it one last opportunity for that animal to survive because a predator in the wild will often lose interest with an animal once it stops fighting and struggling and we'll leave it for later. And so that animal then gets that one last experience to open its eyes, make sure the predator is not there, jump up, shake off all the cortisol that, that, that's switched off these, these organs. And you see this in, in some of the National Geographic videos where an animal escapes a predator. They shake, they quiver, and then they run off. Human beings, unfortunately, due to the complexity of our mind, often don't get the opportunity to shake off those traumatic kind of events and they stay ossified. And that, that, that's one of the problems that we, we, we face when we, we, we're working therapeutically. And that's people. one of those trapped neural trapped neural linkages. Exactly. Nigel, yeah, you exactly. said you didn't give the anatomy. I thought you, that was a brilliant <laughs> a description of it all, really. I, I thought that was great. And, and what, from a, from a person's perspective, though, sadly, too often that freeze response, which has a complete anatomical, neurological, developmental basis, yep. is ignored because people just don't know about it. Oh, you didn't run. What's wrong with you? It mustn't have been that yep. traumatic. In fact, it's the yep. most primitive of instincts. It needs to be acknowledged. And, yep. and I, I think and yep, that's, exactly. that leads us on to co-regulation and, and how important we're talking about interpersonal neurobiology and, and the importance in early age, but throughout life, uh, this co-regulation is so important. We look at people, we come into contact with people. The pandemic has thrown up some real challenges from that ability to co-regulate. How, how, as a psychologist working literally at the coalface, um, what's what's your how have you seen this pandemic and the influence on mental health well it's it's, it's obviously terrible mm -hmm. the, particularly in melbourne where we've had the world's longest shutdown um i think they were about eight months into the shutdown when they realized you know when when people were not allowed to leave their home they they, they only then realized that um a significant number of melburnians lived alone 
So what what they basically created is is a, is a sort of a state of um, solitary confinement for for a number of, of, of people that was leading to extraordinary suffering and distress. Um, so with, with, with the whole kind of idea of, of co-regulation, I mean we're we're highly we're highly collaborative animals, human beings. Um, e. O. Wilson, the famous etym et 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 etymologist, spent a lifetime studying ants, and then, sort of mid-career, he looks around his laboratory and sees all these these other kind of species wandering about, called humans, and he goes, "Oh my God, they're almost as collaborative as ants! Look at what we're building!" And so he he develops a whole field of, of called sociobiology. Um, Human beings are incredibly collaborative. We do it instinctively. We're not a very good um, animal out in the wild by ourselves. We usually lunch for a whole range of species if we're wandering around the, the Serengeti by ourselves or, or, or the outback. So we, we've, we've evolved to link and to be part of groups. And we do that at a collaborative level that's instinctive. And so what happens when we have impositions like, you know, isolating us, uh, restricting us, imposing these different kind of structures that we don't quite understand, it creates a distress because we can't do what we, we're used to doing, linking with each other, talking with each other, going out, having freedom to, 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 to kind of roam and, and, and do the things that give us value and, and meaning. We don't get that opportunity. And so it creates this whole alienation distress. And if people have got any kind of developmental vulnerability, you know, and, 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 and as you know, and your, your stress would have grown. I mean, it, it, it people can go, people can have stress, stressful events growing up. But if 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 they have a good run throughout life, often it never gets triggered. It's when some kind of impediment comes up that all of our vulnerabilities start to mm. flare. You know, as if it's an injury or something like that. But in this case, shutting down our capacity to interrelate, interrelate, whilst we're also being told that there's a threat at the door. Mm. There's this thing that's going to get us, you know, that, that that's there. So what what we what what I think we weren't so good at, and I think you know there's there's good public health governance, and you know obviously you know something had to be done with the, the problems that we were facing. But what what we didn't do well enough, I don't think, is what what happened at the end of the Second World War, for instance, huge social trauma. But there was this this whole galvanising idea about coming together and rebuilding. Um, my, my parents were from Britain, so so I, I grew up with these ideas. But you know, this whole idea of let's get in it together. Something terrible's happened, but we're a community. Let's rebuild. That lifts the collaborative register into something conscious. And I think we haven't really got that tone very well sorted through the whole pandemic. This this idea that you know we're in this, we're, we're supporting each other. Something terrible's happened. How do we move through it? And that, that that's a real positive register for humans, mm. you know, to, to bring that that need for connection, to understand that something horrible and terrible has happened. But let's get together and work work it through. That that's always been a galvanising kind of um, use of, of this sort of collaborative mechanism and I don't I just don't think we've done that very very effectively this time around and it's left people feeling fragmented isolated constrained controlled misunderstood scared and, and it's, it's it's created a, a kind of a um an instability mm. it's interesting because I've for many many years over 30 years been very conscious of the role of the chemical food and pharmaceutical industry in all levels of healthcare. This pandemic has shocked me to now include media outlets and governments putting policies together, which are actually a good economic model on some level, certainly to some groups, but not a very good health model, still not a very good health model. And, and we, I yeah. think we should be expecting more from, from our... And I think the other interesting one is that this kind of approach of looking for one cure to one problem is, is the way we've approached chronic disease. And, and it's because of the long timelines of chronic disease, it's easy to hide behind and make it look like you're doing something, which, which we are, managing chronic disease in the same way that antidepressants manage chronic mental health. Yeah, we, we, we've forgotten that the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. Yes. <laughs> we, 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 we've, we, I, I totally agree. We, we, and and, and this, this is a kind of a problem... In, this this is where the sort of psychedelic stage is a really interesting one because Stan Stan Groff famously said that psychedelics are for the exploration of the mind, 
what the telescope was for the exploration of space and the microscope for the exploration of, you know, the, the mm. cell. So, you know, we, we, we've got a tool here that, 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 that we can use to explore mind if we can kind of start to, to kind of think about that as an issue. Because when, when you're talking about those kind of biological problems and those medical problems, we're, we're talking about causal mm. kind of science. We're talking about very, very kind of, you know, Newtonian yeah. science where A leads to B. Mm. And, and that does work within a limited construct. But as soon as you start getting into complexity mm. and you start to see that, hey, hang on, A affects B, but it also affects K over there and Z over there, but how do they link? And we're not quite sure. We, 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 we're we not very good yet as a culture mm. at exploring and holding and understanding complexities. And I think that's that's the problem. And we, we keep falling back into our more kind of tried and true ways of seeing the world is in linear causal mm. kind of terms. And it works to some mm. extent. It just doesn't explain all the phenomena. So we're not we're not using the scientific method very well, I think, culturally at the no, moment. We, we, well, another one is polarisation and the role of uh, social media. And I, and I hesitate to word, use the word now news outlets. I prefer to use the word media outlets. Um, you know, media outlets and social media have had a dramatic impact on mental health, haven't they? Is that, is that what you're yeah. seeing in your yeah. clinic? I mean, we see it around us, really, don't we? It's a problem because, I mean, as I was saying right at the start, we're relational beings. We experience ourselves through relationship. And so we get this kind of whole world of information coming at us on this two-dimensional screen where we can kind of type away and put anything out into the world without understanding the impact on other. And we push it out. But we, we also know with, from all our algorithms that by pushing this information out, that people are influenceable. So, so things happen when we do, we send the social media out and, you know, we might get lots of hits and that might make us feel good about ourselves or whatever, but it, it, it's all happening in the absence of relationship. So what, what tends to inflate are all the, all, all the problems of not being in relationship, problems of alienation, problems of, you know, that, that's, that's where people get lost in, you know, um, things like, like body dysmorphia because I keep seeing images of what the perfect body is and they're sitting there feeling not quite so perfect and that just amplifies, amplifies, amplifies. So I, th I think social media, you know, it, it could be a great tool for information, education and um, social change. But I, I, I just I think, again, we just kind of collapse back into a poor understanding of, of, of what, what we are as a species embedded in, a, in an ecology. And, and we, we, we get into these kind of, I don't know, partialised ways of, of working. And I think social media is, is a real symbol of that. There's a tool here for interconnection. There's a tool here to amplify, you know, positive, constructive change. But what we're doing is we're, we're using it to amplify our alienation and our isolation and our, our egoic needs to, to influence and to, you know. And then, you know, there's also some commercial realities. You know, some people make good money out of yeah, they, they do indeed. One of the things about, um, I was going to ask about Mind Medicine Institute. You know, you mentioned that, that mm -hmm. you and Trail Dowie are, are putting this together. Can you describe a little, and, and there's training involved. I wondered if you might just share with us what kind of, what kind of a program is that that prepares a practitioner for this kind of therapy? Yeah, thanks. Um, Ron, um... So one of the trainings that the, 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 our, our flagship at the moment is is a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy, and what we're what we're trying to respond to in, in part is the TGA's concern that by rescheduling this medicine there are not enough practitioners out there that understand it. So we've got a, a sixteen week program where we um, uh, have an international faculty who, and, and many of them are researchers who date back to the first legal iteration of this work. So long, long histories of working in this field, understanding both the positives and negatives of it. And we, we, we bring that training in. We, we also incorporate an experiential component. We use holotropic breath work as a non-ordinary state experience so that we can legally talk about what it's like to in, um, to intercept the default mode network to have a different experience with a healthy group. We're not talking about this being therapeutic. It's an experiential training. And so we, we help people understand the nuances so that the training is structured like a trial where we go through a whole process of 
setting up a preparation, helping people understand what, what this uh, state change is all about, leading them through a state change experience, helping them integrate it. Mind Medicine Institute is also building structures around ongoing professional development and supervision to support people that have come through the training. So it's not just, you know, you train now, go do what you like. We're, we're saying let's, let's really build a structured and supportive community of practitioners so that we can, we can bring this, this work through together. This isn't the work that, that this isn't work that's going to be done by one person leading from the front. This is, this is work that's going to require interdisciplinary teams to talk together about their respective wisdom, knowledge and experience so that the doctors can talk to the psychiatrists, can talk to the psychologists, can talk to the psychiatric nurses or to the chiropractors. And we can build an intelligent community that can hold complexity. Mm. And we'll, we'll, um, we're, we're building other trainings to support that skill set. So trainings around techniques like mentalization and metacognition and collaboration um, and, and, and really building a strong and, and developmental psychology. So building a strong educational container to support the clinical emergence of this as a as a practice mm. and technique. Now you mentioned holotropic breathing, and I and I think that came about as a response to the making psychedelics illegal, but still wanting to achieve a similar results. Can you talk yeah, to us exactly. a little bit about holotropic breathing? Yeah, yeah. So when when Stan Groff was uh, when 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 the their training institute, their, their experimental institute was closed, um, the LSD research in Maryland in seventy one. Um, Stan was invited down to Esalen, which is a, um, a, a facility on the west coast of, of, of the US, where a lot of a lot of emergent kind of um, interest was was, was coming. Uh, their their head of staff when Stan took over was Fritz Perls, the man who developed Gestalt yes. therapy. So this was a very vibrant kind of community of, of, of therapists and interested people. Gregory Bateson actually died at Esalen. Gregory Bateson, the, the, the founder of systems theory, cybernetics. So this is a very dynamic intellectual kind of and experiential environment that Stan went into. There were a lot of people, they, they were bringing Eastern practitioners in as well. So and in the East, breath work has been there forever, called pranayama in the Hindu, in Hindu traditions, um, nevma in the, the Middle Eastern traditions and, and di different kind of traditions and Stan and his wife Christina just saw the effect of breath and went oh that's similar to what we were the experiences that we were getting with the LSD let's develop it and so it, it, it was it was a completely um, completely independently defined derived process that uses a combination of relaxation accelerated and deepened breathing music and relational support to bypass the default mode network, to, to create new opportunities to experience self, to experience other. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting tool. It hasn't had an, a, as much um, systematic research as it, as it probably deserves, but um, Robin Kaha Harris, the guy I was talking about before who, who developed the default mode network theory, is now researching holotropic breath, breath work uh, because it's, it's, it's a great um, analogue for people who don't want to, to, to um, you know, take other medicines or, or obviously can't because they're illegal at the moment, but even in a trial situation, some, some people, you know, can get the altered state because when you're doing the breath work, unlike psilocybin or unlike LSD, the breath work gives you choice. You can always come out of the state because it's, it's something that you're consciously and, 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 and organically doing through um, accelerated. Is the breathing. holotropic breath work, would the holotropic breath work be a, a sort of a training wheel version of psychedelic therapy to give people confidence that they could go somewhere that they may not have been before? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, it, and it, it, it's, it, it can be quite a powerful experience. So, you know, you, you can have experiences in it that, that are akin to mm. psychedelic states. As I say, you can choose to go in and out of it, which, which makes it an ideal mm. training mm. tool. I mean, the, the more I learn about breathing, the more I, I, I think it's so, so wonderful. I, I, know, I know it's obvious, you know, the secret to a long life is to keep breathing for as long as you can. But there's a difference between just breathing and breathing well, and now we're even adding holotropic breathing into that 
mix. And I also love this yeah, idea of learning from the past, lessons from the past, you know, ancient yeah. ancient wisdom. Uh, we've been exploring yeah. that through our ind some in Indigenous episodes that we've been doing, um, talking to Dyson Yok Puta about uh, Indigenous knowledge saving the world. Yeah. And uh, this kind yeah. of Indigenous knowledge has the potential to save individuals. Yeah. We, we, we did some, some work with um, Uncle Bob Randall a few okay. years ago out, out, um, out of past Uluru. We worked with some Indigenous uh, medicine women and some of his, 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 uh, his tribe and... Uh, just, yeah, it was uh, quite mm. remarkable. And, and the thing I also have been struck by in this psychedelic approach is that it deals with such intractable problems like PTSD and chronic depression. And I know you, you did qualify it that it's not for everybody, but many people experience breakthrough events that could almost be called cures. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, talk, we, we're, we're really talking about re re conceptualizing mental yeah. health and, and trying to understand what cure yes. might mean from a psychological perspective, yes. you know, because cure is not the mending of a bone when we're talking about mm. the mind. It, 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 it's something much more mm. nuanced. Um, but yeah, what, what we can say is that new states of experiencing yourself and your world can be permanent on the other side of the psychedelic state. You also mentioned supervision, and I can just imagine that this kind of therapy would throw up things very quickly for a, a psychologist in, in this, a therapist in this instance. <clears throat> and I know supervision is important. Tell, talk to us a little bit about supervision in general and what other challenges this kind of therapy throws up. Yeah, I mean, su supervision is, is a, um, a, a, obviously a, a tracking of, of skill development and support for exploration of new of new new territory so supervision is is a collaborative exercise in providing support exploration but also supporting system you know with with, with anything new like this um, we, we really need to get our systematic approach to it really really clear because it's very 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 easy for people to drift off into ways of working that are unique to them you know, as you were saying before on you know we, we we're, we're all different as therapists as well as all different as, mm. as patients and so it, it's, it's kind of a natural human tendency to want to go off and, and do something that you know feels right for you or, or follows your own ideology and i think particularly in the early days of something as radical as, as psychedelic assisted therapy it's really important that we are working in a kind of a collaborative and clear way and so supervision is a way of helping people develop skills keeping them on path um, and, and at the moment we're really informing this through our um, trial structures because there, there are an ever-growing number of clinical trials going on in australia so that that's really the kind of the place that we can do that work um, the holotropic breath work is 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 a, an exploration that we can use then to help people in in support. The other, the other area that we provide the supervision, of course, is in the harm reduction field, because we know that there, there's a lot of community use of psychedelics out there, and we don't sanction criminal activity or anything like that. But we also want to keep our eyes open to the fact that people are using these these medicines, these these, these chemicals but are not often integrating the experience adequately. And so we provide supervision for therapists that are also working with the integration of people that have had poor experiences. And that, that, that's a really important factor because often those people will find themselves in the psychiatric system and will find themselves pathologised in the psychiatric system. And that's not to say that sometimes people take a psychedelic and it does trigger a psychotic illness. That does occur. So it, it's, it's a matter of, of, of being nuanced enough to try and understand, is this an organic psychotic illness or is this person in a transient, unintegrated psychedelic state? And that, that's a really important kind of dis differentiation that we, we try to, to make clear to clinicians in, in, in our mm. training. It's interesting you talk about the, and in the supervision those fire. potential side effects because it's worth mentioning, I think this is true, that one of the side effects of some... Uh, antidepressants is suicidal ideation, and sometimes people actually mm. actually fulfil that. So side effects are always uh, mm. a, 
a, a challenge. It's interesting also to hear you talk about supervision for psychologists because, you know, I, I guess first responders, uh, people in surgery who see major accidents, uh, fire people, you know, I mean, we could all do with supervision, couldn't we? Oh, totally, yeah, yeah. That, and, and, and that's what, you know, what, what we're building in My Medicine Institute is not a, not a community of psychologists. It's an heterogeneous community of paramedics, of emergency physicians, of um, anaesthetists, of psychiatrists, of clinical psychologists, of psychotherapists. We're really trying to build up a, a, a broad um, group that, that can provide that, that intercollegial support in those sort of circumstances because we're, we're, we're in way too fragmented a, uh, a, a community in, in mental health. You know, there, there are too many kind of divisions, too many separations. There's not enough linkage not enough communication and support. We, we all have our skill sets, yeah. but, you know, when we step outside of our skill sets, where do we go mm -hmm. for support? Nigel, this... And supervision provides a, 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 a bit of this, this there. has been fantastic to, you know, you've articulated so many great ideas and, and messages here. I wondered, just finally taking a step back from your role as a psychologist, because we are as individuals on a health journey through life in this modern world, I wondered if you might tell us what you thought was the biggest challenge for an individual on that journey. Um, I, I, I suppose, you know, it goes back to, to, to Socrates, know thyself. Wow. You know, that, that, that's, that's the biggest challenge for any human being on this planet. And if we do know ourselves, then we start to realise that, that we can do extraordinary things and that we've got extraordinary obligations to our community as well. Wow, that, that is fantastic. Nigel, thank you so much for joining us today. I've so enjoyed talking to you and look forward to actually exploring Mind Medicine Institute and some of the wonderful things you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thanks very much, Ryan. Lovely to meet you. Well, what a wonderful episode that was. I mean, I could have sat and talked to Nigel for hours and uh, hopefully one day I'll get that opportunity. I'll certainly explore Mind Medicine Institute and the wonderful things that they're doing, talking about a social evolution. Uh, we, I mean, is there a need for that as we have, as we just fit, talked through there about the individual and how the focus has been on the individual and it uh, comes with great responsibility. And this ties so much into some of the other podcasts we're doing uh, on, with indigenous, elder, indigenous people about Indigenous knowledge and what we can learn from lessons from the past. And, uh, and we have so much to learn. And uh, this whole idea of the psychedelic therapy, which I first uh, attended a, a film put on by Mind Medicine Australia, which explored three individuals' experience with post-traumatic stress and then their... Um, and these were long intractable uh, conditions for these individuals and their own experience through this guided psychedelic therapy and the uh, exciting possibilities there. And for a therapy, particularly a therapy focused on mental health, to have 80% of its, of its individuals who've undergone that therapy describe it as one of the top five experiences in their lives, even 20 or 30 years after the therapy, is quite an extraordinary statement. And the default mode network is such an interesting one because it's also an area of the brain that is the focus of meditation. When we meditate, it, it, it kind of allows the default mode network to make more connections, those neural linkages which we get trapped in. And many of us do, you know, something happens at work and you think about it at night or something traumatic has happened to you and it just goes round and round and round in your head and you're trapped. Those neural linkages are trapped and we need to connect with other parts of our brain and, and, and have that done in a guided and, and, and uh, structured way is a very, very powerful tool. I was very excited to have been introduced to Mind Medicine Australia over two years ago, I attended the, the summit um, last year, which was fabulous. I am definitely going to be doing that course at some point in the next year or so. And I'm very keen to connect with some of the people on that faculty who were brilliant. Trail Dowie will be joining us in, a, in, in another podcast coming up. I'm hoping to connect with many Indigenous elders, people in the Indigenous community, so that we can learn from that 65,000-year culture. Um, so we have so much to learn about connecting 
not just with ourselves, not just with each other, not just with our community, but connecting with the land, connecting with the planet, because we are all connected, so we are all affected. Look, so much to in that episode. Um, I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.